If you were to read Dr. L. C. Woodman's sober and scientific treatise on the affair in the Michigan Medical News, you would know from its very tone that the facts recorded there, though they challenge the basic laws of nature, are nevertheless true. It is a strange and tantalizing account of a man who could not breathe. As a practicing physician in the town of Pawhawk, Michigan, Dr. Woodman had come to know most of his fellow citizens. But he had never heard of Arthur Underwood, not at least until that day in early September 1882, when one of his patients mentioned the man and his extraordinary powers. Well, it's true, Doctor, I tell you. I saw him do it with my own eye. And I was standing right next to him, and I had my eye on him the whole time. All of which simply proves that his hand is quicker than your eye. But he didn't use his hands at all. I told you how he did it. And you examined the handkerchief before the experiment? Of course I did. Just like any other handkerchief. And afterward? Well, there wasn't much left of it afterward. Just a few charred embers. But I looked at those, too, and I couldn't see anything unusual about them. Doctor, I tell you, the man's supernatural. Mm -hmm. Where did you say he lived? Out in the North Road. Got my horse and buggy outside if you want to run out and see him. All right. And I'll show you that he's nothing more nor less than an amateur magician. A half hour later, the doctor and his credulous patient mounted the steps to the porch of the Underwood home together. The doctor knocked at the front door. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hello, Mrs. Underwood. Uh, your boy in? Arthur? No, he ain't. He's back in the woods doing a little hunting. The two men made their way to the patch of woods behind the house. And there, among the trees his rifle slung over his shoulder, they found young Arthur Underwood. Arthur, uh, this is Dr. Woodman. I've been telling him about you, and he's kind of skeptical. He doesn't believe you made that handkerchief burn the way you did. Oh, sure, Doc. I can make anything burn that way. I always have been able to, ever since I was a kid. I'm afraid I'll have to see for myself, Arthur. Now, uh, suppose you start a fire with that pile of dry leaves there. Yes, sir, Doc. Yes, sir. You see, I just bend down like this and and blow. And there's your fire. Before the doctor's astonished eyes, the pile of dry leaves burst into flame. Ignited by nothing more than Arthur Underwood's breath. In a similar fashion, he lit paper and pieces of cloth. He rinsed out his mouth at the doctor's request. He submitted to the most rigorous physical examination. But nothing, nothing could alter the fact that it was his breath and his breath alone that started the fire. And it stands to this day as one of the major mysteries of science. Incredible, but true. The story of Daniel Kittredge was submitted by a listener to this series, but it is only one of thousands of such stories that are brought to the attention of those who concern themselves with the world of the unknown. And so it takes its rightful place in that vast body of evidence drawn from the everyday lives of ordinary men, Evidence that the supernormal does occur in spite of those among us who would disbelieve. In the Chicago police records for the month of August in the year 1925, one will find set down in a sober and routine report the testimony of one Henry Becker, intimate friend of Daniel Kittredge. On the night of August 12th, Mr. Becker visited Mr. Kittredge, and the two men sat talking of bygone days. And suddenly, at 12.27 by the clock on the mantel, Daniel Kittredge leaped to his feet and turned very pale. My brother. My brother George. Something's happened to him, Henry. He's... He... No. no. I may not be yet. If we hurry, we might still be able to help him. You've got your car out in front. Will you take me out to George's place? He's hurt, seriously hurt. If we leave right now, we may not be too late. How could you possibly know all this? We've been sitting I just know right. it, that's all. I, I feel it. Now, come on, Henry, please. 
reluctantly, Henry Becker climbed into his car and drove Daniel Kittredge some five miles out to the apartment building where his brother lived. It was almost one o'clock when they finally reached their destination. All right, Dan. Here we are. It's too late now. George is dead. Did you go up, Henry? I, I just can't bring myself to do it. Cursing himself for a fool, Henry Becker climbed the three flights of stairs to George Kittredge's apartment. He knocked on the door and waited. He knocked again. And then finally, a door directly across the hall opened, and on the threshold stood a woman in a dressing gown. Is he... is he dead yet? Is... who dead yet? The gentleman who lived there. Mr. Kittredge. Why? Why, I don't know. Why should he be dead? Oh, well, I thought perhaps you were a member of the family. I I thought you knew. Knew what? Uh, What's this all about? The poor man had a terrible accident about an hour ago. He came home, his wife was out, and he had no key. So he tried to climb in from the porch, but he fell. He fell all the way down and landed on a cement walk. Oh, it, it was horrible. He was still living when the ambulance took him away, but I'm sure he must be dead by now. George Kittredge died in the Alexian Brothers Hospital shortly after he was admitted there. But the tragic news came as no surprise to his brother Daniel. Like so many other men whose relatives and friends have met a sudden death, he sensed the facts long before he had been informed of them. This, then, is a case like all the cases of its kind. A case incredible, but true. There are strange tales of violent death visited upon those who violated the sanctity of King Tut's last resting place. But most curious of all of these, and best authenticated, is the remarkable tale of the naked man of Newbury, the most baffling of all the stories surrounding the opening of King Tut's tomb. It was on the 16th of February, 1923, that the sepulchral tomb of King Tut was opened. And it was just one month and one day later that the strange event occurred at Lord Carnarvon's ancestral estate near Newbury in Hampshire. On the morning of that day, two of his lordship's retainers sat in the sunroom of his palatial home. They were discussing his exploits in far-off Egypt. But it ain't right, Benton, opening the grave of people what's dead. And them what does it'll suffer for it. Why, I... Oh! Oh, there. Benton on the desk. Oh, blimey. He looks like a wild man. And what's he doing running around stock naked? It was quite inconceivable... And yet there he was, a weird, grotesque figure of a man, his hair flying, his face distorted by a maniacal grin, and not a stitch of clothes on his body. In an instant, he was gone. A message arrived at the Carnarvon home, a message that served only to deepen the mystery. He's sick. He says he's down there in Egypt with some kind of a strange malady. It was bound to happen what was breaking into the grave of a man what's dead. He took to his bed on the 17th of March. Well, now, that's strange. That's the same day we first seen the wild man. Reports of the progress of his lordship's illness arrived regularly at Newbury. And meanwhile, on the Carnarvon estate, the wild man continued to be seen. There came a day when Fenton, seeing the curious figure wandering across the meadow behind the barns, decided to solve the mystery once and for all. He pursued him toward the woods. Huh. Oh, blimey. And now he's gone into the woods. And he waved to me. Just like he was saying goodbye. From that moment on, there were no further reports of the disreputable and indecent savage who had haunted Lord Carnarvon's lands in Newbury. He vanished as suddenly as he had come. As for his lordship himself, there was one last message from those who tended him in Cairo. Lord Carnarvon is dead. 
He passed away peacefully at three o'clock on the afternoon of the 5th of April. There's something very strange about all this, Mrs. Hawkins. The last time I seen the wild man, the last time anybody seen him, it would have been three o'clock in the afternoon in Cairo on the 5th of April. There is no one who has dared to say with assurance that a connection exists between the death of Lord Carnarvon and the naked man of Newbury. Nor has anyone offered evidence to prove that either event bears a relation to the opening of the tomb of Tutankhamun, Pharaoh of Egypt. And yet it is difficult to evade certain disturbing and tantalizing conclusions in view of the facts. Facts incredible, but true. (laughs) 